Okay, so what you've seen there is exactly what it looks like, a Wahoo kicker that moves forward and back and a little bit side to side. Now this is a new product offering from Wahoo, and although the technical specifications mirror that of the Wahoo Kicker 6, the Wahoo Kicker Move sits above in the new premium direct drive product position from Wahoo. So to be clear, the Kicker Move doesn't replace the Kicker. The Kicker will still be on sale from Wahoo, which is a good thing because the Move does come with a premium price tag. Okay, a quick skip through the technical specifications of the Kicker Move. Direct drive interactive smart trainer, so the rear wheel does come off, bike goes on. It does ship with an 11 speed Shimano SRAM compatible cassette. It's an 1128. Bike compatibility, as we'd expect, through axle 142, 148, as well as quick release 130 and 135. Height adjustments now down to three, comes with 700C, 650B and 29 inch. Comes with the kicker access feet for some wiggle wiggle and some adjustability. Over wireless, we get Ant Plus Power, Ant Plus FEC, Bluetooth, FTMS, and my new favorite, Wi Fi, 2.4 gig Direct Connect protocol. If you want to go wired, it also does support the Direct Connect wired dongle. Over those data channels, we'll get power, speed, cadence, claim to power accuracy, plus or minus 1%, max wattage, 2200 watts, 20% gradient simulation, big, massive, 7.25 kilo flywheel, the fore and aft movement, which is the new feature of this one, eight inches or around 20 centimeters all up, moving about 10 centimeters forward and 10 centimeters back. It does come with the pivoting rear axle, so it does support the Wahoo Kicker Climb. However, the Kicker Climb does need an adapter for this. That will be coming soon. Auto calibration has an odometer to keep track of usage, or a very handy thing to check if you're buying one of these secondhand to see how many hours this unit has put on it. Erg Easy Ramp firmware updates will happen automatically over Dircon or via the Wahoo Fitness app, and the unit comes fully assembled. So there is a lot to this trainer. The one thing that I see is missing that other trainers are now offering is that heart rate bridge function where you pair your heart rate to the trainer and then when you connect to the software of your choice, there's just one simple single connection. I'm all about simplifying the connectivity to these devices and that's one thing I think they could probably add in the future to this, fingers crossed. Onto the pricing of this premium level product and this weighs in at $1,600 US, 1,400 pounds, 1,600 euros, about 2,150 Canadian dollars and here in Australia about $2,500. In recent times, we've seen a lot of activity at the lower end or the entry level smart trainer market, including from Wahoo themselves with the price drop of the Kicker Core. But the Kicker Move is at the other end of the spectrum for both features and price point. Now, unboxing and setting up a smart trainer for the first time isn't exactly an easy task and something Wahoo have addressed with a new out of box experience with QR codes and help guides along the way. I've got a bit of experience doing this, so had no problems at all getting things all put together. A closer look at the lockout feature. If you don't want the move to move, straight down with that, and it goes nowhere. Now these reference cards are supplied in the box, measuring your rear axle width, 142, 148, if you're not quite sure which one you have. Required adapters, including the disc brake spacer too. Set up and configuration via the Wahoo app. Once connected, the first thing that I do is set up the Wi-Fi, have it join Alpaca Labs, and there are two configuration options that I always toggle for any Wahoo Kicker, and that is scrolling down, scrolling down, Erg Mode Power Smoothing, I switch that one off, and Race Mode, 10 hertz updates on. Absolutely love Race Mode, so they're both toggled, and away we go. Another thing of note is the rear axle height in the 700C position on the Kicker Move is exactly the same as the same position on the Wahoo Kicker 6, coming in at around 353 millimeters measured. If you're familiar with the Kicker 6, you'll know there's not a lot of wiggle, even with the axis feet, adding just a few degrees of wiggle side to side, depending on how hard you push. Now there's a lot of factors at play there, your weight, the bike you're using, and the flooring you're using, and obviously the setting you have for the axis feet. So they're, Fairly rigid. Now when it comes to the kicker move, there is quite a lot of side to side play. As you'll see here over on the right as I clip in and give it a bit of wiggle wiggle. So a lot more movement side to side on the kicker move due to the design. Now even when I lock out the forward and back motion, the side to side movement is still there. And this did cause a few problems early on when I first set up the kicker move. Here's the details of that. The floor in the Llama Lab is relatively level, so I was happy with that. But to my surprise, when putting the spirit level on the saddle, 
The bike was anything but level. It was just a little bit off, resulting in me trying to correct it as I was riding and encountering this sort of side-to-side -side slop or flop with that free play that's in the kick and move range of motion. So to correct this, I extended the left foot up quite a lot, but not enough to make it rock back and forward with the front foot there. So once that was done, the trainer itself looked like it was a little out of whack, but that's not what it was about. It's about me on the bike and my touch points, which were now level. And this made for a much, much better experience. No longer was I flopping from one side to the other, trying to correct that uh, the bias to the left or the, to the right. This is now level and even and a much, much better experience. Speaking of a good experience, pairing everything via Dircon when the trainer is on Wi-Fi is an absolute breeze. We will pair the heart rate strap though via Ant Plus. Okay, into the game of Zwift. And just riding along, just riding along. You'll see there in the top left-hand corner, the power is adjusting very, very fast. That's race mode. And it's super, super responsive to me putting the power down and backing off on the pedals, allowing me to better position myself, well, off the front of the bunch for this ride. Now to show you how easy it is to engage the lockout mode, Riding along here, unclip, flick down with the left foot. The hardest part's clipping back in and getting back up to speed. Although holding position in the bunch now with race mode is much, much easier with that instant response to the power that you're putting through the pedals. And to re-engage the movement mode, it's just simply that again. Easy to do with the left foot. I always clip in and out with my right foot, so the left was a little tricky. It's a good skill for me to work on. When it comes to out of the saddle efforts, the kickers and the kicker move act very much like a rocker plate with the tendency to lean the bike towards the side that you're pedaling on, which is kind of the opposite of what happens outdoors. So there is a technique to learn for indoor out of the saddle riding with something that moves like this. Not a skill that's transferable outdoors because it's not really applicable. It's not how a bike moves outdoors. But it's something to be aware of. If you're jumping on one of these for the first time and getting out of the saddle, the bike will move a little differently. But uh, once you've got that rocking motion with your shoulders and pressing down on the palms of your hands, it's not too bad. When it comes to maximal sprints, I much preferred the unit to be locked out. So here's two sprints coming up, one with the unit not locked out and a lot of movement of the bike as I'm trying to push the pedal straight down and produce maximum power. It's a little awkward there. Now, flipping the lock out in place, I'll perform another sprint just a little further down the road. And that was, without a doubt, a much better experience. Putting the power out for a little bit longer and not having to fight the bike as it's moving forward and back, which does feel a little unnatural for sprinting in particular. So lockouts for me, for any of the sprints in the future, on the kick and move. Jumping now to my favorite website, the DCR Analyzer tool that allows us to compare data from multiple sources as an overlay and see how things stack up. Now remembering this is just a kicker six underneath it all. So we shouldn't be seeing any surprises here, but we do need to test it. So here we are, the Llama Lab Test, Kicker Move, Asiyama Duo, up against the Powermax NG Co. Just riding along here in my 200 and 250 watt steady state. 217, 217, 214.9 from the Powermax NG Co. All looking pretty good there, no trending up or trending down. That's all looking pretty good. Into the sprint, that's looking pretty close to me for the short sprint, all within a few watts there at the 1100 mark. Overs and unders, the ERG performance from the kicker move was as expected, nice and responsive over Dercom. You can see there the telltale signs of an ERG change in resistance, so it kicks up a little harder before it stabilizes, and a bit of a dip through here, uh, 217, 219, 214, all within a few watts there with those changes up and down. 
that was all good. Flywheel speed test, which is an important one for a trainer test. So low flywheel speed, uh, the trainer can apply that resistance there of 225, not too bad. Spitting up a little higher, I think a little bit wavy at a higher flywheel speed, and then defying the laws of physics. We really, really spin that trainer up with that big flywheel. Most trainers do fall apart here. This is performing quite well, only within a few watts difference there. The kicker move reporting a little lower, but you should never be doing erg mode sessions in the 5311. That's just not good. If you're familiar with the Lama Lab test and my other reviews, that's looking pretty good for this little section through here. But that section there is designed to break trainers, and it pretty much does. Two little short rampies into another sprint. Response time there looking great. Uh, there's always going to be an offset with the recording being at one second, but that's looking fine. No major differences there. Into another sprint where the power to max, I think, jumped up a little higher. But uh, overall there for the Llama lab test and just riding along, looking good to me. Jumping now to indoor test number two. Now this is an interesting one that I'm just thinking of adding to the Llama lab test. This is a heat test where I have the room pretty cold as I start. I turn the heater on and ride through an erg session to see if there's any drifting. With the warm up done and calibration performed here is a 20 minute steady state. Kick and move, Asio Majuos, Machine P505 base, all within one or two watts of each other. So kick and move 200, Asio Majuos 199.78, Machine P505 base 201.6. Again, no trending up and down there. So it's all looking good there for the final steady state test. Under the third and final data set we'll look at with this trainer, two sprints, one without the lockout, so with movement, the next one with the trainer locked out, and then some just riding along tests. Jumping into this little sprint here, and interestingly enough, the peak powers weren't too far off, being it either locked out or not locked out. However, I did find it a little hard to sustain the power as the trainer was moving around. So not too far off there with these two power meters, but when the trainer was locked out, I had a much better sprinting experience and the data indicates that too. The numbers there, what within 10 watts at 1279, 1269. So looking really, really good at the top end for the sprint. Beautiful to see. So I'm just riding along, just riding along, a little bit of an erg test here. And I think I teleported there to Coco or something on Zwift. 198, 198, all looking really good. The kicker units do estimate cadence from your pedal stroke, and that does depend on how smooth you are and where the peak power phase is. So here for the short little erg that I did, uh, 96 versus 98, so just two RPM off. But then when I switched to sim mode, just riding along, uh, 86, 86, so that was fine. So I guess it really is a little bit subjective of where you're putting the power out in your pedal stroke and how smooth you are, but cadence overall, not too bad, definitely usable. So one of my summaries and conclusions after a few weeks of riding the Wahoo Kicker Move, look, overall, it's a great trainer. It's a Kicker 6 on rails. The Kickers, for me, have always had a good ride feel to them, that big weighty flywheel. You can never spin the thing out. It's great for sprinting, hill climbing, pretty much all types of indoor riding. Durkon and race mode, so that 10 hertz update is also a new favorite of mine. And being able to do away with AMP Plus and Bluetooth and all those complexities out the window, this thing just works. Connectivity was absolutely brilliant. Now the forward and back motion, that's a welcome addition for me. It's not a must have, but I can see the benefit there for people who are after a little bit more movement indoors, who don't want the massive footprint of a rocker plate or the additional height those can also introduce. The quick lockout is also a welcome addition, just reaching down with your foot, clicking it out if you want to get some sprints done or you just don't want to move around on the trainer. If that was hard to access or you had to get off the bike to lock it out or lock it back in, that would be a no-go. But the quick lockout is a good thing. Now the side-to-side -side wiggle is an interesting one and it did bug me early on before I got the bike level and stopped the bike sort of slopping or flopping from side to side. So it was interesting to see that the unit does need to be tilted for the bike to be level. That was just here in the Llama Lab. I'm not quite sure if anybody else had the same issue when it comes to the leveling, but that's how I solved it. And from there on, it was good to go. Now, as already mentioned, the price on this one, I think, will be a limiter for a lot of people, where there's a lot of attention on the lower end with the Zwift Hub, Elite dropping their prices, and even Wahoo dropping their prices on the Kicker Court down to $5.99. They're all pretty good trainers, and they offer a very good workout. Will people be willing to pay the premium for the top, top-level Kicker with that movement? I guess time will tell. But I do like that this is not the new Kicker, not forcing people to pay that jump in price. And if you don't want the movement, Go on by the kicker, or at a lower level to stay within the Wahoo ecosystem, the kicker core, or if you want to keep those wheels on, they also have the snap and the roller still on the market. One important thing for me was the power numbers coming from this unit were good, 
so I can sleep easy at night and making sure everything lines up. And I will be able to use this trainer to compare other power meters to. So that's a pretty good benchmarking system. And finally, I am keen to see how this unit goes with the Wahoo Kicker Climb when that little foot adapter arrives. There's a lot of physics and engineering that are gonna be involved in trying to solve that one with the bike moving forward and back and going up and down. Stay tuned for that one, I'll cover it when it arrives. Alrighty, with that one, we'll leave it there. That's the Wahoo Kicker on rails, the Kicker Move. One of two new products released today from Wahoo. As always, if you found this informative, give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe to be across more videos on this channel, and thanks for watching.